Okay, we will now begin talking about rotations in the plane. A very simple yet surprisingly interesting topic. In this video, we won't even invoke component spaces and we'll only discuss rotations geometrically. Nevertheless, we'll be able to determine four of their fundamental properties. Then in later videos, when we do bring in component spaces and discover the matrix representations of rotations in the plane, we'll be able to confirm the discoveries we're about to make algebraically. So let's begin our geometric discussion. We're talking about rotations in the plane and we'll restrict our attention to rotations with respect to the origin. Of course, you can rotate the plane with respect to any point, but all of these other rotations are not linear transformations as we discussed before. And our current focus is on linear transformations. So we'll only talk about rotations with respect to their origin. In other words, rotations where their origin stays put. And of course, rotations are one parameter family of transformations. In other words, you only need one number to specify the entire rotation. That is the number by which we are rotating. And there's a bit of convention. When the angle of rotation is positive, that means we're rotating in the counterclockwise direction. So here's rotation, excuse me, counterclockwise direction. So here's rotation by pi over four. You start here, rotate by pi over four. And of course, when the angle is negative, you're rotating in the clockwise direction. So here is rotation by negative pi over four. And because rotations are one parameter family of uh, transformations, you can denote them like this, R, sub alpha, where alpha is the angle by which you're rotating. And it's, so it's, here's the single parameter that defines the whole transformation. So let's now talk about the first property, perhaps the most important of the four. And that is when you rotate by an angle alpha and then follow up that rotation by another rotation by the angle beta, what's the net effect of the two rotations? And of course, it's equivalent to a single rotation by the angle alpha plus beta. So rotation by alpha followed up by rotation by beta equals a single rotation by alpha plus beta. So let's capture this uh, statement with a formula. This is a geometric discussion, but even geometric properties can sometimes be best captured by formulas. By geometric, we simply mean that we're not using component spaces. So we have r sub alpha, followed up by r sub beta. And the interesting question is, do you write it on the right or do you write it on the left? So the first instinct might be to write it on the right like we do with regular numbers when we're multiplying them together. But transformations happen in the opposite order, as do functions. I'll just give you a quick example from ordinary functions. Let's consider sine of cosine of x. Of course, we would write it like this. I'll skip parentheses, sine of cosine of x. So cosine comes first, sine comes second, but nevertheless cosine appears on the right and then sine appears on the left. So similarly here, these functions were applied to x, but when we're talking about transformations they are applied to some vector v that I might write in here. So here's r sub alpha of v, and now when I'm applying r sub beta to this result, it would of course go here. So this is what rotation by beta that follows rotation by alpha looks like. And now I can actually erase the vector v so that the focus is on the transformations themselves as applied to any vector whatsoever. And as we just said, the result is a single transformation by the angle alpha plus beta. So that's actually property number one and I will simply repeat it right here. R sub beta followed up by uh, the opposite order, R sub alpha followed up by R sub beta equals R of alpha plus beta. And just a quick look ahead, when we represent rotations with respect to any basis, 
So in other words, when we will talk about component space representation of rotations, and these guys will become matrices, we expect that the matrices will satisfy the same property, where this is, of course, interpreted as multiplication. Right now, it's this expression on the left-hand side is interpreted as followed up by successive application. But when it comes to matrices, as we discovered, it becomes multiplication. And we expect to see this property. It will be a one-parameter family of matrices. And, we're ex and we expect to see this multiplicative property that is completely independent of the choice of basis. So we're in this chapter, we talk a lot about what depends on the choice of basis and what doesn't. The way length preservation looks depends on the choice of basis. Looks perhaps particularly simple with respect to Cartesian bases, a little bit more complicated with respect to arbitrary bases. But these matrices, although they will look very different in different bases, we still expect them to satisfy this property because it's completely geometric, has nothing to do with the choice of basis. Now, first consequence of this formula is that these two rotations commute. Because if we did these rotations in the opposite order, it would still be R sub, maybe beta plus alpha. But of course, there's no difference whatsoever between beta plus alpha and alpha plus beta. So the order of these two doesn't matter. So these two rotations commute, which is a little bit unexpected because we expect, generally speaking, transformations not to commute. But this is a special case. And if I had to give an intuitive reason for why these matrices commute is because it's just so simple, there's nowhere to go. You know, uh, not a very good explanation, but maybe better than nothing. Well, here is another important consequence of this relationship. What if beta was negative alpha? What if beta was negative alpha? Then the result would be rotation by the zero angle. And rotation by the zero angle is the identity transformation. It's the transformation that does nothing at all. So let's write it down this way. R, I'm now going to use alpha, combined with rotation by negative alpha. And because of this property, the order doesn't matter. So I wrote it in this order equals the identity matrix. In other words, the inverse of R sub alpha is R sub minus alpha. It's, it's the inverse transformation. And then when we're talking about matrices, we'll, ex we'll expect the same property from the matrices, that the inverse of this matrix will be, the matrix from the, will be a matrix from the same family with minus alpha substituted for alpha. Very interesting. Okay, but this is how I write it. It's a little bit more symmetric, so to speak, than writing that R sub alpha to the negative first power, meaning the inverse, equals R sub negative alpha. But that is an equivalent way of writing it, which I won't write down on the blackboard. Now let's talk about the final property having to do with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. When we talk about linear transformations, we, we very much like talking about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of those transformations. So what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this transformation? Well, the answer is very simple and not entirely satisfying. That typically, except for very special angles, there are no eigenvalues and eigenvectors, unless it's rotation by pi, in which case every vector becomes opposite of itself. So if this is the vector v, then when you rotate it by pi, it becomes this vector right here minus itself. So this is r sub pi of v. So when you're rotating by pi, every vector becomes opposite of itself. So every vector is an eigenvector. And minus 1 is the eigenvalue corresponding to all of them. When you rotate by 2 pi, every vector becomes itself r sub 2 pi of v. That's, that's the identity transformation. Rotation by an even times, even number times pi. And then once again, every vector is an eigenvector. And, every, and 1 is the eigenvalue corresponding to all of them. Otherwise, there are no eigenvalues. Because no vector is a multiple 
of its pre-image, of what it started out as. No image is a multiple of its pre-image. So I'll just to make it accurate, I'll write unless alpha equals, I'll write it like this, pi n, where n is an integer. So unless alpha is a multiple integer of pi, as we just discussed, there are no eigenvalues. That's the last property. So I think that's about all we can say about trans, uh, excuse me, rotations in the plane without the use of component spaces. So in the next video, we'll study rotations in the plane with respect to this basis right here, the Cartesian basis. That's where our discussion will start. And then we'll discuss rotations with respect to a non-Cartesian basis.